uh, Florian Berger, our speaker today, uh, who gives the talk from uh, Utrecht, Netherlands. Um, uh, Florian now is a head of uh, theoretical uh, biophysics laboratory in the University of Utrecht. Uh, he is working on biology, biophysical modeling, uh, various processes, and uh, in particular, uh, he is interested. Uh, a big part of his research is devoted to studies of uh, molecular motors. Uh, recently, he also started to apply um, uh, neural uh, network techniques uh, in his research. Um, yes, yeah, so. Pro today's talks is uh, about molecular motors and uh, I welcome uh, Florian uh, for you to speak. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Roman. I will share my screen. Do you see this? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for organizing the seminar and giving the opportunity to me to um, introduce you a little bit to our efforts to understand active processes in biology that are driven by molecular motors. And as far as I understand, the audience here is quite diverse, probably with different backgrounds in um, physics, mathematics, and maybe also biology, and also on different career levels, I guess. So there are maybe students, also professors. It's always a little bit challenging if you do these uh, virtual seminars because you don't really see the audience and you, don't, you also don't really see if they get bored or if they don't understand something. So please, if there is a, something you want to know further or if there's something not clear, raise your hand that's possible in Zoom or just shout or ask me. So because the audience is very diverse, I thought also it would be nice to have a, like a little bit of a broader introduction that also is always good for me to motivate myself why we are trying actually to introduce these quantitative approaches to understand biological systems. And then after this little bit broader introduction, I will give you two examples how we think or how we study these uh, molecular motors and how they drive active processes. So one remarkable feature of, I would say, almost all life forms is motion or activity. And already Schrödinger said that uh, living matter evades the decay to equilibrium. And it is doing so by these remarkable active processes. So what you see here, you see two videos. So in the first video here, you see in red a T cell that attacks a pathogen cell in blue. And here in the lower video, you see um, cargo transport in a neuron. So these are vesicles that are transported actively by molecular motors. So what we or what my lab is trying to understand is um, to develop a quantitative biophysical understanding of these active processes. And the next step, of course, is to define a little bit better what do we mean by a quantitative biophysical understanding. So for this, we can go very back in, 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 in history and time and realize that actually physics comes from, from philosophy, right? And in the beginning, most physicists were philosophers and they started to describe what they saw in nature just by words. And here I, I, I give an example for such a physical law that is described by only by words. So any solid lighter than a fluid will if placed in the fluid be so far immersed that the weight of the solid will be equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So this rather basic physical principle you can of course formulate in words but you can also formulate it in, in mathematical equations and this is what we are trained in or what is more common in our field now to to phrase these laws in, in mathematical equations and the advantage of these mathematical equations of course are that they are very precise and you cannot argue much about it because I would say with words it's a little bit easier to to argue what they really mean. Is that a, was that a raising hand? Did someone a question or okay oh, sorry. No I haven't seen any questions yet. Because there was something <laughs> there was a beep on my Yes side. I'm going to monitor the questions but uh, if you want you can also close chats uh, in your screen which is shared by the way i think <laughs> yeah uh, that's it. i see then i can also sorry okay now it's maybe better okay so 
going from these um, description in words to description in equations, I would say the, 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 the really the fathers of modern science were Galileo and, and Kepler because they really started to connect um, natural phenomena with mathematical equations. And also as Galileo stated that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. And this actually gives us then the opportunity to measure things and then we can compare things and we can also make very precise predictions. And then we can see if experiments actually fit our, our, our models or our understanding of, of, the, of the system. And as Bill Bialek actually introduced this concept of the wiggle room, which I really like because he says, only through this quantitative understanding, we can reduce the wiggle room. So there's not much um, room for, for arguing about a phenomena anymore. But on the other hand, it's interesting when you think about these biological systems that somehow they have escaped that kind of understanding in the last, in the last years. And, and this is actually what we try to develop. So my personal opinion on this is why these biological systems somehow escaped this kind of understanding that we developed in physics is because they are poised at a very interesting um, an interesting position if you think about the complexity of these systems. So, so this goes back to Weaver from a very interesting paper he wrote. So there are different classes of complexity in physical systems. And before the 1900s hundreds in physics, the most systems you can describe as problems of simplicity because it was only a few degrees of freedom. So here I, I sketched the as an example, this, this, this pool table with only one ball on it. So if you exactly know the initial conditions, you can calculate the trajectories. And then on the other hand, after the 1900s in, in physics, in, in thermodynamics and statistical physics, researchers concentrated on, on systems which we were called disorganized complexity. So this is a complexity where you have a lot of degrees of freedom but somehow they are kind of similar and then you can use statistics to analyze them. And living systems are actually poised somewhere in between. So they show this kind of organized complexity. So this means they have a, maybe hundreds or thousands of degrees of freedom and it's very complicated to find a unifying descriptions for them. And often the, right now, I think often what, what, what the only thing we can do often is starting doing simulations and see if the models that we put in, if they make sense and if we can um, make um, consistent, consistent prediction with experimental data. So there's this other field in physics where people try to underpin or developed a lot of um, theory and models how actually um, order comes about or order is derived from from active processes and this goes back of course to Prigozhin. So there are two examples that I illustrate here. So one is the Belusov Jabotinsky reaction and the Rayleigh Bernard convection that you're probably familiar with. So the idea here is that you although you're far away from equilibrium you see an order appearing on larger on larger scales. And this order is quite interesting because we see order in, in living systems and these, th this order is often driven by, by active processes. So this brings us back to the two movies here. So we have the, the T cell on the top and here the, the um, cargo transport and neurons. And the underlying molecules of this activity, these are always, these are always um, molecules that transfuse one kind of energy into the other energy, right? Because this is kind of a, the uh, typical example of an engine. And one big class of these molecules are molecular motors. And here's a movie how we think about these molecular motors. I will introduce them a little bit to you. I, I don't know if you have a background in, in molecular motors or if you know these molecules. So essentially what these molecules do is they transfuse chemical energy into mechanical energy by hydrolyzing ATP into ADP and an uh, inorganic phosphate. And by this energy transduction, they power intracellular transport. So they walk along these filaments in this step over step fashion. You see they walk along this way. And then there are also, there are also other kinds of motors. They, they, they rotate 
or they do other things. So, but they are usually the underlying um, proteins for activity. So what our group is mostly interesting is interested in is to understand if we can build up different or if we can, we can uh, develop an, an, an quantitative description on different scales by building up on these molecules. So if we, so the idea is if we understand how they work on a single molecule level, can we actually combine them to understand how they, how they function in a, in a collective a small ensemble and then from the ensemble go up until we understand how they work in larger scale systems and drive the organization and function in cells. But lately I also thought, or I, I started to think about that, I think the other approach is maybe also quite valuable to start to think about a, a top-down approach where we start with a phenomenological description. So we start with an experiment and see what's going on there and then think about what are the control parameters that we can control and then try to describe the system from this perspective and then match it back to the underlying molecular mechanisms. So we develop these description and base them on, on physical principles from non-equilibrium physics and statistical thermodynamics also. But what I want to emphasize and what I will also talk about in the next 10 to 15 minutes is that I'm also very convinced that it's very important to develop tools and methods actually to analyze and interpret data. Because only if we have a better understanding how we can also connect experimental results from different groups and also from different molecules, then we can reduce this wiggle room. So we can really start to quantitatively analyzing biological systems. So this is one project I want to give you a little bit of background in is uh, how we bio or how we started to characterize the single molecules, these molecular motors. Okay, well, what are the basic observations? So to understand what we are trying to, to, to develop here, it is uh, quite easy if you just think about these motors that they walk along a filament, they can bind to this filament and they can unbind from this filament stochastically. And these processes, of course, depend on the force. So under which force these motors are, if you, you can think naively about it, if you rip the motors off the filaments, they will unbind um, very fast, of course, if they are under a high load. And also you can think that probably the velocity will depend on the force. So researchers in the last 10, 15, or even longer now, they probably from the starting, they started in the 90s actually to measuring, measure how these molecules react to forces. And the typical experiment is done with optical traps because with these optical traps, you can apply forces on the range of piconewtons. And this is exactly what these molecules also produce. So the idea here is that you have a molecular motor here. It's a dynein motor depicted with these two great donuts. And this motor attaches to this microtubule filament and then it's connected to this polystyrene bead, which is then placed into an optical trap. Here's typically with this orange laser beam. And now this beam actually stays constant and the motor walks along this filament. By walking along this filament, it pulls this bead out of the trap center. And because of the potential that this optical trap um, creates, the force on this bead increases, also the force on these two bonds, and then the motor will unbind from the filament. So there are two basic observations, of course. One is that the velocity actually changes with the force. And you can assume that this is just linear. So this is usually the, the, the most simple or the easiest assumption you can do is you can say, OK, the force now decreases linearly. I can actually do this here. So the force actually decreases linearly until it hits the stall force, and then the velocity is 0. And the other thing is that the unbinding rate increases exponentially with the force. And this is just a factor, which is a characteristic force, and we call it a detachment force. So this velocity, you can also just sketch it briefly. So this is the force, and this is the velocity. And then this just goes down linear until it hits the stall force here of the motor, and then it's 
then the motor stops, of course. I mean, this function goes on like this, right? Okay, so here's an example of this kind of experiment of the setup. So what you have here is, uh, is the optical trap is here, then you have the bead, you have the motor, which has a certain elasticity that we assume it's linear, so it's just a hooked-in spring with this kappa m. And then the motor here, this is the motor, it can unbind with a certain rate and it can walk forward with a certain velocity. Both of these quantities depend on the force and then it's held in the optical trap. So the optical trap potential can be also modeled as a linear spring, which is here the kappa t. So what you will see of kind of trajectories when you do such an experiment is you see that the bead goes up. So the force actually increases on the bead. And then at some point, the motor actually detaches from the filament and the bead snaps back to the center of the trap and the motor is unbound. So now you can repeat these kind of experiments and you can measure a whole distribution of these forces here. This is shown here. And this is a real measurement for kinesine motors. So my question is that I started to ask here is if we, is there, sorry, question? No. Okay. No, no, no question. Right. So how is the macroscopic uh, probability density function, so something that we can maybe fit here, how is this actually connected to these single uh, motor properties? But the problem here is, is that this force actually, so the force that is applied on the motor in the trap is actually um, time dependent. And in these quantities, the, the unbinding rate is for a constant is for a, for a constant force here. So this is our constants. So the idea is how can we connect these things? So how can we derive this probability density function connected to the single motor, um, to the single motor properties? So what do we expect? So if we have a motor that is slow and that unbinds fast, what we expect is actually that the forces that the motor creates, so this is depicted here, so it can only go a little bit forward and then it will unbind. So you will only measure small forces and maybe a probability distribution like this on the side. If you have a motor that is fast or that slowly, un or yeah, sorry, fast motor or slow unbinding motor, so the motor actually travels very fast forward and then, or it, it, it does not really unbind. So this means that it creates or generates a lot of force. So it will go up until it hits stall force, where it cannot produce more force, and then it will unbind. So the probability density of, of the measured unbinding forces in these kinds of experiments maybe look like this. So here you already see that these distributions, they should somehow, or the shape of the distribution should somehow depend on the, on the, on the molecular, on the dynamics of the molecular motor. There is a question. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, Rafael uh, uh, Petrosian is asking, why is force time dependent? The, the force is time dependent, the force that you measure, because what you measure here, you, in the experiment, you measure the, the distance of, you measure the position of the beat. And this motor walks forward with a velocity, so this actually, this delta x changes in time. Is that clear? Yeah, I believe so. So in okay. other words, uh, uh, and the force then, is, uh, uh, depends on time through the position of the motor, which is exactly. changing, right? And then usually what you have, you know, the, the, you, know the, you know the stiffness of the trap, and then what you measure is the position of the motor and, yeah, on, on time because it walks forward. And this is the force that you, that you then measure. I think it's clear. Okay. I have another question. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Florian. <laughs> so, uh, my, my question is so, th there are different experimental setups in which, uh, in some of them, you are not able to measure the force, but only um, the scatter light intensity. So, for example, in, in our experiments in the past, we, we were incurring the force from a pre previous calibration of the trap in which. Uh, the B was always in the linear regime. So we were saying, okay, if the particle is the B is in X, we can infer the force by a simple Hooke's law 
Uh, however, in the tracing you're showing, you're, you're plotting directly the force. So you will be able to measure the force done on the beam directly, or is it an indirect measurement based on a calibration of the trap? It's a, yeah, thank you for pointing it out. It's actually, yeah, so this is, this is actually what we measure is X, and then we calibrate it with a, with a, with a um, stiffness of the trap, because we know we can also measure it that it's in the linear regime, the trap. Oh, okay, okay. So okay. Yeah. what is actually measured is the distance. Actually, what is measured is actually the distance of the bead from the center of the trap. Yeah. Okay. No, because uh, I know that they are depending yeah, okay. on how far the, the bead is going, sometimes you can also move out of the linear uh, regime of the trap. Yeah, that can happen, yeah, I think. But usually, you, you, you yeah. I mean, okay. this is. And, um, and there's a other setup, I will talk about this maybe later. Yeah, I will briefly mention it where you actually, you can also um, use a feedback system and there you can apply a constant force on the motor by always adjusting the position of the trap while the motor walks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Also works. Okay, so now I'll come to the, because um, I thought there are also uh, some people who like equation in the audience, so I thought I'd bring some equations here. So now what we actually do is we, we combine or we derive these, uh, this probability density for these unbinding forces. And this is related to a binding probability here. And then we assume that this binding probability or the, the time derivative of this binding probability can be assumed to be a first order equation with this unbinding rate here as a function of force. And then if we combine these two equations, we actually end up with this one, which gives the unbinding rate as a function of this probability density. And then we can also invert this and um, solve for the probability density. It's, it's actually not too complicated, the whole thing, but here you can already um, see something very interesting I found is actually that here, this equation always depends on the unbinding rate divided by this loading, loading rate. Yeah, and the same here. So it actually it depends only on the ratio. It's, so, what, what, so that also limits actually then our inference that we want to do because from, this, from measuring this probability, we can only get the ratio of these two quantities, right? So here for a very simple, for the very simple system that I introduced earlier, where the um, unbinding rate depends exponentially on the force and where the velocity depends linearly on the force. And with these uh, linear springs here, which connects actually, uh, this gives how the force is actually transduced here, or trans I would say, I should say transmitted, sorry, not transduced, or the, how the force is transmitted onto these bonds you can readily write this down and then you can use these equations and plug them in here. And then, as I said before, because this is a ratio, you will get a ratio of these two quantities in this expression, which exactly gives you the run length. So if you think about it, it's, 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 it's not, um, I mean, I, I did the calculation and then afterwards I thought about it, but I could have, thought about it earlier that this should not give you any um, actually any information about the dynamics because somehow that time is not relevant anymore here right because you you measure the, the, the forces and not about nothing about the dynamics this well is, uh, may yeah. I ask but uh, you have a, a time derivative of the force inside so this thing is, uh, as you actually anticipated in your examples, depends on the protocol. Exactly, it depends on the protocol here, yeah. That's right, but this equation does not depend on the, yeah. Yeah, it, okay, all, all, yes, thanks for pointing this out. All what I wanted to say here is that I cannot determine either the velocity or the unbinding rate from this equation, I can only determine the ratio of both from this one. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, and then you can do this actually, we use this experimental data here and then we fitted this um, 
simple model to it and it fits the data very well because here probably you underestimate in your experiment because these are very small forces here so it's in the noise more or less but if you if you use this equation to fit the experiment data what you get out is actually that the stall force is almost 15 piconewtons and here this is the run length this x0 is about 500 nanometers and this detachment force is 2.2 and then if you, um, so I, I compared this to, res to, to results from the literature and then you see, okay, we are away a factor of two or yeah, a little bit more here, also a factor of two, but the detachment force actually works quite well. So yeah, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting way, but probably uh, there are too many fit parameters here for only this data set. But then what we uh, use this equation in the next step, which I think is, is, is is um, quite interesting is actually to, to determine now the, the mean because we have the distribution so we can also calculate the mean unbinding force here and we can excuse me uh, Florian uh, there is again a question okay. uh, what was the functional form for uh, probability of the force f the functional form yes I believe the expression may be uh, do you have it's anywhere the, yeah what is explicit expression for f oh that's a long f. expression i didn't put it on the slide <laughs> because it's too long all right sorry <laughs> i mean but you can actually solve it analytically because in in this in, in this case you can you can solve it here it involves some um do you have a paper with this result has been yeah, yeah it's published i give the reference in the summary all right very good uh, so then yeah. Uh, but what you can actually do here if you calculate the mean force and you assume that the unbinding rate is actually constant it's not it is not dependent on the force anymore this is a crude assumption that you can make and then you can derive actually analytically a very simple equation so for me that was quite shocking because you have like these complicated integrals and then you have this very simple equation here in the end and this is now very useful because you can use this now in experiments because this equation has one parameter here, which is the, um, the, the stiffness of the trap and the stiffness of the trap you can change in your experiments. And then from a fit of this equation as a function of the stiffness of the trap, you can infer in principle the stall force and the run length. And this is, this is quite powerful now because there are actually molecular motors human dining in motors, they are very low processive. This means if you have them in an, in an optical trap like this, what you always measure are very low forces. And it's very difficult to determine the stall force of this motor because it almost never reaches the stall force in the experiment because they unbind before they generate large forces. So we did this with the experimental data with Arne Gennerich together. And what you see nicely here in this, in, in, in this graph, so, the green line is actually the force measurement. You see that we can almost perfectly fit this um, result with these um, two parameters here, with the, with the stall force and the, and the run length. And this is, these are the results from the fit, which are very good. And because we, because we still needed to do this very crude assumption that the unbinding rate is actually constant, we did another measurement with a force feedback trap. So with a force feedback trap, what you can do is you can apply exert a certain constant force on the motor so the trap actually or in this kind of experiment what you measure or what you have you you you, um, you use the feedback to adjust the distance between the bead and the trap center so while the bead is pulled by the motor you adjust the trap so you also with on a piezo stage you actually um, you actually keep the distance between the bead and the center of the trap constant. And because you can, um, help, you can keep this constant, you exactly know the force that is um, exerted on the motor. And then from this, you can also measure the, the stall force and the single run length, which is a very good agreement with the experiments. So in this part, I, I wanted to show you a little bit that we are trying to develop these, these concepts to reduce the bigger room and to introduce frameworks to understand these motors better and to, to describe them. And I want to acknowledge here the, um, the collaborators from which I got the data. So one is Arne Gennerich. I have a long uh, collaboration, a long, yeah, 
long and very productive years with him. And then the other collaborator is um, Paul Seven from the University of Illinois. And here um, are the publications. If you there's also this um, quite cumbersome expression for this um, distribution of the forces. This one is inside of um, the first one here. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. There is a question yeah. uh, in the chat. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, uh, so Matteo Marsili is asking, uh, I'm confused, your theory gave the force that is a factor of two away from the experimental one, but the fit works. Is there a reason for this? Yeah, that's uh, that's that's quite interesting, but we used to, that's also different data sets. Sorry, maybe that was not clear. So here, this is a different data set. This is for, or kinesine one data, it's a different motor protein. And here we, we did it for human dynein. And the thing is for this experiment, what you do, what you have to do in the experiment, you have to change the trap stiffness. So you have to do one experiment at a certain trap stiffness, measure a lot of these forces, and then you determine the mean force here. And then you change the trap stiffness, you do a lot of measurements, maybe 500, and then you determine the mean force again. And this kind of data set is actually not available for kinesine, for this one here, because here I only have one distribution at a certain trap stiffness. So in principle, it would be super interesting if I can convince someone to measure, it, but it's also a lot of work because you have to yeah, you have to do a single molecule. Okay. Uh, I hope this would uh, answer the question. Uh, yeah. Is it all right? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, thanks. all right. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay, and then the next um, last part of the of the of the seminar here, I want to talk about a new collaboration now in Utrecht with uh, Anna Akmanova, and. This is mostly work that has been done by a master's student that I supervise, Ona Gross, and um, other students, uh, Peter Jan and Hugo, and also in a collaboration with um, Lucas Capitain. And here we look actually at the role of molecular motors during T cell activation. So this is again this movie that I showed before. So we have a T cell here in red that attacks a pathogen cell. So a lot of things are going on during to, uh, during this process actually. And here's a very simplified cartoon. So you have this T cell and it looks like this kind of, and then it attacks this uh, pathogen cell. So it's a, uh, yeah, uh, a cell that needs to be destroyed or well, your immune system decides that the cell is not a good cell and it needs to be destroyed. So what is happening here is actually that you have in your, in, in cells, you have a cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton here is, um, is depicted in, um, in, in black and consists of these microtubule fibers. They are connected at the centrosome, which is here in red. And it's also called a microtubule, here is MTOC, it's a microtubule organization center. So what happens is when the T cell docks on this pathogen, it forms a synapse. This is this interface here. And then, so, sorry, yeah, this interface, it forms the synapse. And then this microtubal organization center is actually pulled over close to the synapse here. To, um, and, and, and this process is called polarization. And this is done because then the uh, secretory lysosomes can actually start eating up the other cells or attacking the, this, uh, this other cell here. Uh, and we are mostly interesting how this polarization actually works and what are the molecular players during this polarization. So in the experiment, what um, they found in, in the Akmanova lab is that when they knocked out a certain molecular motor, which is called KIF21B, they found that the cells cannot polarize that efficiently anymore. So here, what you see is a side view. I hope this is clear, this is a side view of the cell. So here, they form this interface. And in blue, you see the nucleus. And then here in purple is the actin. So this is the cortex of the cell. And then this green marker here, it should be here, or you can see it here better. This is actually where the centrosome is. So it means that the centrosome um, actually relo or, um, relocalized from behind the nucleus to the synapse. And then if you do a knockout of this molecular motor, this KIF21B, 
then you don't see this anymore. So the centrosome is actually above the synapse here. And you can also quantify this. You say the, here's the distance from the cover slip. So this is the wild type here. So it's very close to the cover slip. And these are the knockoff experiments. So the idea is that in the absence of the kif 20 b motor, the polarization, the polarization is impaired. So this what usually um, should be the normal process that the microtubal organization center is actually translocated to the synapse. It's not happening anymore if this motor is depleted. So to understand a little bit what's going on here, to understand this mechanism, we started to do some simulations. And we wanted to understand if we can actually uh, reproduce this phenomena with a with this agent-based simulation. So we, we used the Langevin simulation package, was, which was developed by Francois Nedelec, um, to, to, uh, to um, simulate these different processes that are going on. So what are the key players of such a simulation? So we, have a, we, we need a shape, of course, that's the cell, and we need a nucleus and a microtubal organization center. So this is all modeled with elastic interactions and then also some steric interactions. But what is uh, most important is now how the microtubules actually are modeled. So here they are elastic fibers, so they have a bending elasticity, then they can, they can, they can grow and then they can shrink. So the growing and shrinking are different states of the fiber. And there is a certain rate, it's usually called a catastrophe rate. It goes from the growing state into the shrinking one, and then it can start growing again. And then we have these um, KIF-21B motors here. This is what's happening here. This is a motor. So the motors, they can bind to the filament, and then they walk along this filament. And this is very interesting because it has been known before that these motors actually, they interact with the tip of the microtubule. They introduce a pause in this growing dynamic, and then they introduce shrinking of the fiber. And then the next key player that we needed is uh, cortical dynein. So this is also a molecular motor that is embedded in the synapse here. And when, it is bind, when it's binding a microtubule, because it walks in this direction, but it's anchored here in the membrane or in the, in the cortex, the microtubule is actually pulled in this direction. And this, actually, this creates or generates the force that in the end pulls the microtubule organization, organization center towards the synapse. So here's a, now a simulation that we run. And one on the left, the simulation here on the left side is the, is the wild type. And uh, sorry, that's actually wrong. The wild type is here, and this is the knockout. So what you see in the simulation are these black fibers. These are the microtubule fibers you see in red here is the um, microtubule organization center. And now we introduce the synapse and the blue dots are the dynein motors and they start now pulling on the fibers. And with this, the microtubule organization center should actually move towards the synapse. This is what you, how can I start this again? This is what you see here in the wild, in the wild type. And then in the, the orange dots here in the wild type situation, are the KIF-21B motors, they interact with the microtubules and shrink them a little bit. You see, they can somehow regulate the length of this microtubule network of these microtubule fibers. And the length of the microtubule fibers here are essential because if they are overgrown, what we see here in the knockout, then the cell got somehow stuck. So the, the, not the cell, but the microtubule organization center got stuck behind the nucleus and the cell cannot efficiently polarize anymore. And this is exactly what we see in the experiment. We can now also quantify this a little bit better. Now with, a, with, a, with these simulations, we can look at the mean microtubule length. So this is just a transient. So this is how we initialize the, the simulations. And then after they reach a steady state here, we can measure the, the, the microtubule length in the simulation. And then we see if we add now these molecular motors that the, the length is actually decreasing. So the motors, they regulate the length of the microtubules and the microtubules need to have a certain length because if they are too long, then the cell cannot polarize anymore. And this is also what we see in the polarization time if we start measuring this polarization time. So if we increase the number of these motors, the polarization time actually decreases. And this is quite interesting because we only need to 
add a few of these motors, there's only a hand few of motors. And this is also consistent with the, with the experiments because in the experiments it's very hard to, to stain the KIF-21B motors. And this is probably because there are only a few of them in the cell. So we can also look at the uh, trajectories of these centrosomes. So how do the centrosome in, uh, actually um, polarizes? And it's quite interesting because at first it, it fluctuates a lot behind the nucleus. And then at some point it starts to, to repolarize. So this is the distance from the microtubular organization center to the synapse. And here it seems when we add the motors, it just takes longer. But it's not that the speed is different, but it's more that it wiggles around and then it just stays in this metastable or in this stabilized state here on top for longer until it polarizes. So we also quantified this a little bit better and looked at the, at the forces that are produced. So we introduce here this um, factor which we call the force imbalance by just um, um, projecting the forces onto the synapse here on this plane. And then we have either a force from this side or a force from this side. And if this is what is R and so left and right. And then if these forces are the same, then this factor should be zero. So this is happening here. So you have on average, you have um, the same force from this side of the nucleus and from this side of the nucleus. So the system is stuck in this position and if we increase now the number of um, KIF-21B molecules, this force balance is actually broken and it goes towards a value of one, of course, because it's, it's normalized. And then the centrosome actually can translocate to the synapse. And here it's, it's actually an interesting system that I also want to explore a little bit further is that this is probably an effect of the small numbers of microtubules. Because if you have a lot of microtubules, it's very likely that all of them are somehow bound. And then you have this uh, stuck and stall or restricted um, situation. But if you only have a few microtubules, it's more likely that you have an unbalance in it. And this is what we quantified here, actually. So this is the total number of, of microtubules. So if we increase, the, sorry, this is the total number of microtubules that are bound to, to, to dynein in the synapse, at the synapse. So this actually decreases with the number of KIF-21B molecules, but this um, difference between left and right microtubules actually increases. And this is probably only an effect because you have a small number of, of uh, microtubules. And here you can see also, we looked here at the trace, which is quite interesting. So the solid lines are the centrosome distance and these uh, dotted lines are the difference between the number of microtubules on the left, on the right. And sometimes you see actually these attempts where the system actually tries to polarize, but it, it cannot finish it. And then, so it, it goes actually back into the stalled position. And then here, it seems that if this, so if this dotted, line actually reaches a certain threshold, then a polarization can start and um, the cell polarizes. Yeah, so with this, I already want to uh, summarize. So what I'm trying to do or what we try to do is to, um, to develop this uh, quantitative understanding by building uh, biophysical models between scales. So what I told you today about was a project where we, where we are looking at these single molecule behaviors of these molecular motors and how we can understand data from optical trap experiments. And then I also showed you a little bit uh, an, an approach where you, where you jump into the middle. So you start with the whole process, which is very complicated active process in the cell. And then you try to recapitulate what's going on with the simulations by putting in these different agents and how they react. But I think in the end, so what the long-term goal would be, of course, to connect both sides here in the middle. And yeah, that, that, that would be actually quite, quite cool. And then also go to actually larger systems here and think about transport and maybe neurons and axons. And um, with this, I also want to advertise that if you are interested in these things, um, come and work with us because we are quite an uh, interesting team of cell biologists and also uh, physicists here. So what we are trying to understand are these uh, transport systems. And here what you see is actually a super nice rendering of an 
of one of these T cells, the microtubule network. And now we want to connect these um, experimental data, of course, to biophysical models. And I think there's a, a big need actually to bridge this gap between images and videos and models. And uh, I think Roman also mentioned it in the beginning a little bit that I started to investigate how we can bridge this gap with um, machine learning techniques and also deep learning techniques. So if you're interested working with us, then please contact me. Yeah, so um, thank you for your attention. And then I, of course, um, would like to answer all kinds of questions if there are any. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Florian. Uh, thank you. Uh, I invite uh, anyone to, from the attendees list to ask questions. The problem, should I stop sharing? Let me see. Uh, well, you can stop and return upon request if necessary. Because then I see the chat. <laughs> Okay, okay. So there is no question in the chart, but uh, if anyone wants to connect uh, audio and ask, uh, please go ahead. Uh, okay, well, while we expect in any incoming questions, I would like to ask actually, but uh, I, I was a bit curious about uh, the, when you mentioned that you started applying uh, this machine learning techniques, uh, could you, unless there is any information, sensitive information to release, uh, can you uh, describe what uh, you're trying to study with uh, machine learning in these projects? Yeah, so I mean, the, it's, it's quite complicated actually because machine learning, um, if you, I mean, I probably also discussed it with you, it's, it's always, what do you want to do with it, right? And um, I think for some things, we have very specific t uh, tasks, actually. So uh, maybe I can switch back here to this slide. So, of course, one problem is what I think machine learning techniques can be very useful is just to enhance the quality of images and videos, because this is nothing else than a nonlinear filter for it, right? So there's always a, and, and this has been also developed in, in Dresden at the Max Planck Institute. So there's, there's always a trade-off when you do these uh, fluorescence microscopy uh, experiments that if you have a, if you want to have high resolution, you need a high laser intensity, but this induces light damage and also photo bleaching. So this means you can only record for a few minutes. So the idea is that you, um, you acquire a data set with high laser intensity so you have a very good signal to noise ratio, but you do this only for maybe one or two seconds and then you switch to a lower laser intensity. And then you record the rest of your experiments with a very a low signal to noise ratio. And what you can do is now you can use the data set that you acquired in the beginning with a high laser. You can use this to train a neural network to match the high laser intensity images um, to the low laser intensity images. You understand? I see. Yes. yes. Yeah, so this is nothing else than just training a nonlinear filter, right? Okay. You, have, you just have a lot of parameters and you have the nonlinear filter. Well, the specialist would know. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's a, it, it's super cool to do this because it, it, it works very well, actually. And then the other problem is if you if you look in, at, at this other video where you see this microtubule network here, then tracing is of course interesting because you want to trace single microtubules and you want to understand how many of them are there, what are the crossings. So there's of course, we have now people in the lab, they actually do this by hand in a virtual reality where you trace these microtubules in a 3D system. And um, we are trying to understand if we can use actually also these annotated by humans annotated data sets to train a network to trace and detect certain objects in uh, these uh, microscopy images. So this is a little bit what, what we're trying, but it's still, yeah, it's still work in progress. And maybe I can come back in a few years and give another talk about it. <laughs> oh, all right. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do we have uh, incoming questions? Um, may I ask a question? Yes, of course. Sorry. Yeah, uh, back, back uh, to that uh, question about the uh, uh, time dependence of the force. So 
time dependence of the force you meant like not the unbinding force depends on time but just just the force depends on time is that right yes so unbinding force it does not depend on time because it's just like the like force mm -hmm. yeah this is how you define it but here the unbinding yeah so the unbinding force what i i define it as the force that you measure under which the motor yeah, when the snatch, uh, like when the unbinding happens yeah exactly this is stochastic variable yeah so on the force depends on time because you pull and also because the mot motor moves yeah so you don't really pull but the motor pulls itself okay yeah because the motor uh -huh. moves and then it increases it's a little bit like if you are fixed on a wall with a rubber band and you would now step away from the wall then the force that you feel increases while yeah. you step and then you are slow down probably and then at some point you cannot walk anymore and this is the stall okay. force yeah. i don't know if you know these rubber bands from gyms you know where you do like work yeah sure. <laughs> no this is clear yeah i was confused because i was thinking the unbinding force depends on time and the mean uh, force expression that you showed yeah. this this is the how okay yeah so this is mean unbinding force exactly and and it, it is calculated from the this uh, force probability density function is it exactly so you take this uh, big function and okay. then you plug okay. it then in here. okay integrate but the problem is for this you need to uh, plug in some unbinding rate some assumption of the unbinding rate and also yeah. of this of this force velocity relation and i could i mean i'm not a best mathematician so i could only solve this under the assumption that the unbinding rate is actually constant i mean i would have liked to solve it for an exponentially increasing unbinding rate because this is what we think is actually going on in the system yeah i mean this exponentially in like force dependence of rate was like bell's model and this exactly stuff. exactly but I, I mean maybe you can solve it i i couldn't but it would be actually nice to see. So what I did, I did the crucial assumption that I, I, see, okay. I actually um, approximated an exponent with a constant. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There is uh, one more question from the chat. Uh, Luciano Bruno is asking, um, uh, so th uh, saying thanks for the talk. Uh, and thank how you. do the forces modify in the, ah, you can read, all right. Okay, thanks for the talk. How do forces modify in the presence of many motors on the beat and if the motors are able to diffuse on the surface of the vesicle? That's a very good question. And I, I actually, I always wanted to sit down and do the calculation, but I, I don't know. I mean, it would be very valuable because I know that people are doing these kind of experiments. Probably you also know about it. So, because one problem with this, and it's not a problem, but one disadvantage of the single molecule experiments is that you need to know that you're under single molecule conditions. So this is very um, time consuming actually. So what is quite easy is actually that you code beads with motors and you don't know how many motors they are. On average, you know there's many motors and then you would do the same experiments. So I thought about it actually, but one, one other, there's another technical problem is that if you have a lot of motors, they can also create larger forces. And then the problem can be that you get out of the linear regime of the trap. But it's actually a quite, this is a quite interesting uh, problem also with the diffusion on the, on the vesicle because the diffusion on the, of the motors or how the, as far as I understand if this is correct, um, or this is what, what you mean with this question is that the motors are actually diffusively anchored on the cargo, right? So it diffuses in the membrane of the, of the vesicle. And this will probably effectively increase the binding rate because it can find the microtubule better because it has a certain range that it, or a certain space that it can, can ex explore. Yeah. It's, a quite, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. I think there's a lot of potential just to do the calculations. I don't know. All if right. I, I, I hope that answer, uh, the question. answers, yeah, equation to the best of uh, your ability okay. now. Uh, all right. Uh, we may accept any other question. We have three minutes still of uh, Florence time. 
Yeah, I can also, if someone wants to talk a little bit or chat, I mean, a little bit. I don't know okay. if this is live streamed here on YouTube, but um, maybe. Uh, well, also, this will be a global design, I understand, to the, uh, to the uh, channel of uh, our section. Uh, yeah, I can also uh, stay a little bit longer here and then we can have also some. All right. Uh, one last question from me. Uh, maybe this is a, a superficial resemblance, but uh, sort of. Uh, I see that you have uh, you can apply different protocols uh, to these experiments. At least the first uh, experiments where you had different uh, distribution of forces. Uh, uh, is it um, possible to uh, find a way for Jarzinski uh, equality to be applied in these uh, experiments? And then, what kind of um for the Yashinsky equal. Uh, but I, I, think, I think it's interesting that in this case, you probably may, uh, uh, because you know the potential of the trap, you probably uh, could, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, could you, know what is uh, the real um, uh, free energy landscape. But then the question is, uh, when the motor is pulling with the arbitrary protocol, uh, does there, um, statistics uh, verify the work that is done verifies the Jarzinski equality. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. But I think the, the, the so, so there are two things to this question. So first with the protocol, I think it would be super interesting because you can also, not related to Yashinsky, but what you can do is in experiments, you can change the, the position of the optical trap. So you can also ramp it, you can, you know, drive it with a constant velocity or something. So you can think about, is there an optimal way of measuring biophysical quantities from of these motors by um, adjusting the trap, you know? So this is, this is one way. And, and then with the Yashinsky, I think the, the problem there is that for the Yashinsky relation, but uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, you need uh, two different uh, states, right? Or what you usually do is you measure the, f or you want to have the free energy difference between two different states. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. yeah. And then it's not clear with this motor, what, is the, what, what are the different states? So you can, of course, say, okay, when the motor runs into a stall, maybe this is a state. Mm -hmm. Because it unbinds before, then I don't know. What would be maybe interesting is to think about the molecule here, right? A little bit I more see. on a molecular scale. What they did also with the DNA unzipping and Yashinsky, that you think the motor provides a random protocol and you want to understand the elasticity of the motor or something, you know, you want I to see. determine yeah. the free energy difference between um, extended state and more contracted state or something of the protein itself. That would be maybe um, something that would work. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question from the chat, uh, Max uh, Morphidi. I assume that epsilon unbinding rate is constant. You mean that it is just time independent? <clears throat> yeah, so usually the, uh, here usually it is here the first equation, usually you assume it's, it depends exponentially on the force. This goes back to Bell and also, I mean, you can probably also derive it from Boltzmann equation. <laughs> but um, what I assumed here to solve the, I really assumed it's a constant number. So it does not depend on anything. It's just a number. Because otherwise I cannot solve this integral. You see, this is, an, this is here an integral over the exponent and the exponent has also an integral in it. Yeah, this is, maybe there's a way of doing it, but I, I, I just couldn't do it. So it would be interesting if someone finds it, find out. No, that looks problem. actually like a Laplace transform if you introduce yeah, the exponent. <laughs> so. yeah, <maybe. laughs> You should look in the table of Laplace transforms, perhaps. It's probably in there. <laughs> All right. I hope right. this would answer the question. Uh, yeah. Do we? It seemed to me that I heard someone's voice, or maybe. Uh, no. No, I see no. Uh, 
no one is asking any more questions, but we also uh, finished our time. All right, then I thank uh, Florian for this very interesting talk indeed. And uh, uh, in the chat, there was someone who also complimented <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, your talk. Uh, all right, uh, you see the applauses uh, from Zoom. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, if uh, anyone is willing to continue conversation, yeah, so I can, or I write in the chat. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very I much. I will stop this here and then we can go to. Uh, Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Oh, it's good also to see some people. I think it's a little bit, was my first time actually.